to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ now to the married i command yet not i but the lord a wife is not to depart her husband first corinthians chapter 7 verse 10 welcome to our study of the book of first corinthians first corinthians deals with church problems problems among members of the body of christ that are affecting the church as a whole as you come to chapter seven and chapter eight the problem paul is writing about deals with the marriage relationship and deals with knowledge that causes some to be puffed up over other people concerning idolatry and maybe meats that are sacrificed to that. There's the marriage relationship and knowledge in which Paul is dealing with in these two chapters. You can tell from 1 Corinthians 7 verse 1 that the Corinthians had written to Paul. Paul said, concerning the things which you've written to me, it's good that a man not touch a wife if he does earn a woman that he doesn't have to. And so his point is, it's good if you can remain single to do so. That's the main idea that Paul is getting across. They seem to write with some questions, and in this chapter, Paul is going to answer those questions. Now, to apply these teachings to us today, we've got to be able to understand the context so that we can apply the question being asked or the answer to ourselves today. What does 1 Corinthians 7 teach us about? First, they ask Paul, is it better to stay celibate and single or to be married. And Paul says in verse 1, if you can refrain, refrain. But it's not a command. He's saying in these times, in the times of persecution when the church was severely hated by many, when Christians were having to defend their life, why would you want to carry around the baggage of also having a family to think about? If you can remain single, do so. But he says, if not, Verse 2, let each husband and each wife have their own mate. Don't what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7 verse 2. If you can remain single, Paul says, good, you do so. But notice what he says in verse 2. 1 Corinthians 7, Paul says, nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. Paul says you need to honor God's original rules on marriage if you're going to be married. Each wife, she has her own husband. Each husband, he has his own wife. Now friends, you can learn from this that marriage is monogamous. That is, it's between one man and one woman for life. That's God's original standard. In Genesis chapter 2, God created all the things in, in the world and no helper was found for Adam. And the Lord God caused Adam to fall, to fall into a deep sleep. And from Adam's rib, he made Eve. And Adam saw her and he said, This is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken from man. And the divine comment in verse 24 is, For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. There are several important lessons we can learn from 1 Corinthians 7, 2 and from the original command in Genesis 2. Each man and each woman are to have one mate. That's the way God originally designed it. Romans 7 verses 1 through 4 teaches that at the point of death, then when your mate dies, you are in an unmarried state, you are single, death ends, marriage there. But we need to realize as well that, friends, we must only have one mate. God has never set up man to have more than one wife. Is it true that people did that throughout the times? Yes, some of the kings did that. But did you know God commanded them not to? Deuteronomy 17, verse 17, God said, I don't want you to multiply wives. I don't want you to multiply horses. I don't want you to do those things. That's something that wasn't commanded by God. There have always been basic principles about marriage. But friends, in the day in which we live, how people need to hear that man, that marriage is for a man and a woman. You will never find in the Bible God authorizing men and men and women and women in marriage. Marriage is for one man and one woman. In fact, Scripture clearly condemns homosexuality and the lesbian acts that are so frequent in our world today. No, regardless of what court system or what state decides that homosexuals can marry, 
God never intended that and He actually condemns it. Leviticus chapter 18 verse 22 and Leviticus chapter 20 verses 12 and 13, such was an abomination in the sight of God that was punishable by stoning. Well, someone says, well, that's under the old law. Did you know that the New Testament says it is a sin against God in nature? Romans 1 verses 26 through 29 it is against nature, it is immoral, it's ungodly, and people who do it will receive the punishment due them, that is, eternal punishment, if they do not change their ways. Now, someone says, are you telling me then that if two men get married, you're saying they're going to be lost in hell? Listen to the words of 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9 and 2. Concerning the Corinthians, Paul said, such were some of you. Well, what were they? They were fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, sodomites. He says, and these people will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. What people? Those who are not going to go to heaven are those who remain in fornication, remain in idolatrous relation states, or those who remain in homosexuality. And so, yes, the Bible clearly teaches homosexuals will not go to heaven. That's what God says clearly. Now, how does that relate to marriage? We need to honor the holy state that God put marriage in to last for life between one man and one woman, and that alone. That's God's original decree, and that's what Paul is referencing in verse 2. But then he makes this note in verse 5. He says, yet, if you do seem to have trouble or if there are some things you need to reconcile, you're not to deprive one another sexually except for a season and then be reconciled to one another. A wife is not to withhold from the husband. Husband is not to withhold from the wife. That's something God created to be holy. The marriage bed is undefiled, Hebrews 13, 4, and you shouldn't use that as a tool against your mate. And it's something that if we allow it to get out of hand and if we use it that way, that could definitely lead to sexual immorality. And so they'd ask Paul, about things like these. Now, Paul then gets to the heart of the matter as he deals with Christians who are married and who are having problems. Well, what about two Christians who are married and they don't seem like they can make it? What should they do? Paul says, don't depart. You hang in there. You make it work. Don't divorce. Notice 1 Corinthians 7, uh, 1 Corinthians 7 verses 10 and 11. Paul says this, Now to the married I command, yet not I but the Lord. A wife is not to depart from her husband, but even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband, and a husband is not to divorce his wife. So if the wife wants to depart, Paul says, don't do that. If the husband wants to depart or divorce his wife, he says, don't do that. You remain together. Now, friends, how we need to emphasize to young people and how we need to ingrain it in our own minds that when you say, I do, you really did, and you need to make that last. Marriage is something that you stick in there, you make it work. It's your one opportunity to find someone to help you get to heaven. Maybe your mate's not perfect. Well, you know what? You're probably not perfect either. None of us are in that way. And so we need to stick in there. We need to have the attitude, till death do us part, we're going to make that work. Now, realize this. The Lord taught very clearly on marriage, divorce, and remarriage that there is one and only one reason scripturally that a person can divorce his mate and then only the innocent party has the right to remarry. Notice the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 19 verse 9. It seems like in the context the Jews have come to Jesus to kind of trick him and they say, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? And Jesus says, well, well, from the beginning it was not so. God created the male and female. What God has joined together, let not man put asunder. And so his point was, no, you shouldn't do that. And then they said to Jesus, well, why then did Moses uh, command to give her a certificate of divorce, Deuteronomy 24 referenced. And Jesus said, you said command, Moses permitted, and the motive was because of the hardness of your heart, but from the beginning it was not so. Now look at what Jesus said in Matthew 19 verse 9. Jesus said, and I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. The exception clause is if you divorce your wife and it is for fornication, sexual immorality, you then are free. The guilt, the innocent party is free to remarry. But that one who committed adultery, the Bible says whoever marries her, he commits adultery and whoever she marries, they're in an adulterous relationship. And so what is the one and only reason in Scripture divorce? For divorce, 
fornication, sexual immorality, illicit sexual act outside of the marriage bond where God has authorized that with another person. That's the reason for which one may divorce his mate and then you must be the one to do the divorcing. It is not as though you can wait until they get in a position where that's, you know, they've committed adultery with someone 10 years later and you can say, now I'm free. The point in time in which that occurs, divorce had to be the reason and you had to be the one enacting at that divorce on that guilty party. That's the clear teaching of Matthew 19, 9 and Mark chapter 10. But again, remember the basic principle. Jesus, or Paul said, don't depart, don't divorce, and if you do, here's what he said. If husband divorces his wife, 1 Corinthians 7, verses 10 and 11, they've got to remain single or be reconciled to one another. The basic principle is God has ordained that marriage to be holy. And if they divorce, they can't go out and marry other people. If it's for reasons other than fornication, in the context it seems like it is, then they don't have the right to go out and marry someone else. God's not authorized that, and if they do, they'll be entering into an adulterous relationship, and thus they remain single or they're reconciled to one another. Paul then deals with some other questions in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. One of those is dealing with a Christian, non-Christian marriage. Well, apart from these two Christians are married, what if we've got a faithful member of the Lord's church and then he's married to a non-Christian? Maybe they were both non-Christians, they took the gospel to them, one of them obeyed it and one of them didn't. Well, what if they're having trouble in the marriage because this man or this woman no longer wants to live that life anymore? What should they do? Now look at the command again in 1 Corinthians 7, verses 12 and 13. Don't depart, hang in there and make it work out. That's what Paul says. Verse 12, put to the rest, I, not the Lord, says, If any brother has a wife who does not believe and she is willing to live with him, let him not divorce her. And a woman who has a husband who does not believe, if he's willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. Now, Paul says, I, not, but not the Lord Friends, when Paul, Paul, when he quoted 1 Corinthians 7, verse 10, when he said, I say this, yet not I but the Lord, had actually known the Lord to say that. Now, here's the clear teaching. Paul says, this is what I'm saying. That doesn't make it any less inspired. How do we know that? Well, just three chapters later, in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 37, Paul said, If any man thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge the things which I write to you. These are the commandments of God. And so Paul knew Jesus had said that in Matthew chapter 19, verses 1 through 7. Paul had not heard Jesus comment on a Christian, non-Christian relationship, but because he was an inspired man of God, he was guided by the Spirit to write these words. And so don't think when Paul says that it's less inspired. It's just as inspired as the rest of Scripture. And what's his point? If you've got a, a wife who's not a Christian, you hang in there and work it out. Don't divorce her. If you've got a husband who's not faithful, you hang in there and work it out. Don't give up on the marriage relationship. Your marriage is in some ways set apart, sanctified, verse 14, because one of the mates is a Christian. Well, what then about verse 15? Some people come to 1 Corinthians 7 verse 15 and now claim that Paul is giving another reason for divorce other than what Jesus gave in Matthew 19, 9. Notice the words of 1 Corinthians 7 verse 15. Paul says, But if the unbeliever departs, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. Is this a, another reason for divorce? Is Paul saying here, well, I want you to stay together, but if you can't work it out, you're no longer under bondage to that marriage. No, and here's why. The word not under bondage is not talking about not under bondage to the relationship, for we know that they were married to one another. The Greek word doulo, here used, literally means a slave. Now, those who claim that Paul is giving another reason for divorce have relegated the state of marriage to slavery. Do you believe you are a slave? Do you believe that your wife is a slave? To you. Is that what God teaches about marriage? No, absolutely not. Are we to work together to help one another get to heaven, heirs of righteousness together? Absolutely. But never is the marriage relationship likened into a slavery relationship. This word, dulo, is used 133 times and it never refers to the marriage relationship. In fact, in the same context, the Greek word dio, bond or contract, is used to refer to the relationship in verse 27 and in verse 39, Paul used a totally different word to define the marriage bond or relationship and it's not the word 
used in verse 15. Well, why did Paul use a different word in verse 15? Here's why. Marriages are bound by God's law until death or divorce severs them. The scriptures clearly teach that. Genesis chapter 2, it's till death do us part. God is joined together. Man should not separate. Romans 7 verse 4, death does end a marriage, verses 1 through 4. And we learn clearly, my friend, that the relationship that's being spoken of is my relationship to Jesus. Paul says if you've got a brother who departs, who's, or someone departs, who's not a Christian, you're not under bondage any longer. What's he talking about? He's not talking about the marriage relationship. Paul's already used a different word twice. Here's what he's saying. If that non-believer decides to depart, you're no longer under bondage to them to such an extent that you leave Christ and follow them. Friends, make it known the Greek word is used to describe my relationship to Jesus. Romans 6, verses 17 and 18, God be thanked that though you were the slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which were delivered, you've become slaves of righteousness. We are. The Greek word doulo is used to describe my relationship to Christ. I'm a slave, I'm a bondservant. But it's never used to describe the marriage relationship. And thus that means if a non-believer says, you know what, you've got two choices. You can go with me or you can give up Christ. You're not to do either one of those. You can, you can go with me and leave, and, and leave Christianity or I'm going to leave you. Then you say, you know what, I'm under bondage to Christ. I must remain faithful to Him. I must never give up on the Lord. Does that mean then that you've got the right to go and remarry anybody you choose? No. That's not what's under discussion here. It's your relationship to Jesus. I don't give up on Christ and go follow that non-believer. I'm bound to stay true to Christ all the days of my life. And so that's the principle being discussed here. And Jesus only gave one reason for divorce, and that is for fornication. Now, another question arises verse 39. Notice 1 Corinthians 7 verse 39. They're asking Paul now about widows. What's the principle for widows? Paul says in verse 39, a wife is bound by law as long as her husband lives, but if her husband dies, she's at liberty to be married to whom she wishes, but notice this, only in the Lord. Now God has set certain specifics in order for marriage to be right. What does it mean only in the Lord? A wife is to marry, a widow is to marry only in the Lord. Well the phrase in the Lord is used to represent uh, in, in accord with God's teaching. For example, Revelation chapter 14 verse 13 says this, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Now are we going to say in the Lord there means every Christian? No, because every Christian's death is not blessed. Only those who have lived their life in accord with God's teachings. The phrase in the Lord I don't believe means a faithful Christian. I believe it means one who has the right to be married. If we're to be blessed in our death and only those who die in the Lord are blessed, then only those who have died faithful to the Lord's teaching. Now let's apply that to 1 Corinthians 7 verse 39. If she is to remarry only in the Lord, and that phrase in Revelation 14 verse 13 means those who die faithful to the Lord's will, then she's only to remarry according to the Lord's will. The basic will set out in Genesis 2, Romans 7 verse 4 teaches, or verses 1 through 4 teaches, she does have a right to marry if she was married to only one person, and if he has died, then she must look to God's standard. Is he a candidate for marriage? Will he help me get to heaven? Is this someone whom I can pray and study and, and, and work with in the kingdom? I think that's the principle set forth here that God is enjoining upon Christians. If not, were she to marry a non-Christian? Do we understand the principle there? We would have to say, to repent of that, she would have to divorce that person. So I don't think that's what Paul is here teaching in this context. Well, what about 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 1? Paul then now is going to discuss some knowledge that leads to arrogance and especially knowledge that is puffing certain people up over other people. Look in 1 Corinthians 8 and verse 1. Paul says, now concerning things offered to idols, we know that all have knowledge. We all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. This is a type of conceited knowledge. We know more than you, and so we can go out and do this, and you can't. He's not saying that knowledge is unimportant. Jesus said it was. John 8, verse 32, you've got to know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Knowledge is essential to salvation, but a type of knowledge where it builds somebody up where they can look down their nose at someone else, 
That's the type of knowledge that is condemned here. Knowledge just for knowledge's sake does puff one up. Knowledge without love is pride. Proverbs 16 verse 18, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before fall. But knowledge with love that's where edification is. That's what he wants these Christians to have. You may know, here's his point, you may know that there's nothing wrong with eating these meats. You're not going to the idol place of idols to worship them. It's been taken in the market. It's being sold in the store. It pretty much has lost its connection with that. But if there's a weaker brother who doesn't understand that, you can't say, tough, I'm going to do it anyway. You need to, with your knowledge, temper that with love and not put pride in its place where you can help others come to that understanding also. My friends, it's not only what you know, but it's who you know. We need to make sure that we're concerned about other people coming to the Lord and living the way God wants them to in this life. Now, in chapter 8, Paul also deals with the conscientious person, the person whose conscience is weakened or defiled because of certain meat that people are eating that's been down to the place where idols have worshipped at or where they've worshipped idols and then that meat is taken to the marketplace. Well, what should we do about the person whose conscience might be weakened? Should I be considerate of it? Should I just go ahead and do it anyway? What does Scripture teach? Look in chapter 8, verses 7 and 9. Paul says, however, there is not in everyone that knowledge. Not everybody understands that. Some with con for some with consciousness of the idol until now eat as a thing offered to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. But food does not commend us to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, nor if we do not eat are we the worse. But beware, lest somehow this liberty of yours becoming a stumbling block to those who are weak. What about those people who it really bothers to do that? And they see you over there doing that. Paul says you need to consider the weaker brother. Book of, Ro Book of Romans teaches us this principle over and over again. In chapter 14 and 15, Paul is going to say, if it causes my brother to be lost, I won't do it. Food in God's sight is a matter of indifference. It's not something that is going to cause us to go to heaven or hell inherently. All food is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. But if me eating that might cause somebody to be lost, I ought not to do that. Notice the words of Romans chapter 14, verse 23. Look what Paul says about being sensitive to the weaker brother. He says this, He who doubts is condemned if he eats, because he does not eat from faith. Whatever is not of faith is sin. If someone who doesn't know whether that's right or not is made to eat that and he's not sure, Paul says he's condemned already because he didn't run it through the filter of testing and proving all things by the Word of God. And thus we've got to be considerate of those who may not have the knowledge to understand that this is not going to cause someone to be lost. The principle is this, don't cause a weaker brother to be lost over something you know is a matter of option. You could say to yourself, well that's foolish, I know it's not wrong, you ought to know it's wrong and I'm going to do it anyway. That's the wrong attitude. Look at 1 Corinthians 8 verse 11 and notice what Paul here says. Paul says this, And because of your knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. Christ died just as much for him as he did for you. And because he's weaker in the faith, are you going to say, well, I can do this and you just can go to hell if you don't like it? No, that's not the attitude we ought to have. We ought to have the patience, the love, and the kindness to try to guide that brother along. In fact, Here's what Paul says. Paul says, if your attitude is wrong and you do that anyway, you not only sin against that brother, you sin against Christ. Look in chapter 8, verses 12 and 13. But when you thus sin against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I'll never again eat meat, lest I break, make my brother stumble. How serious is this? Paul says, if you have that attitude, if you don't like it, then I'm going to do it anyway, whether it causes you harm or not. You've sinned against Him, but you've sinned against Christ. And are you going to cause that weaker brother to go to hell over something that's just an optional matter anyway? Paul said that's foolish, that's inconsiderate, and that is the type of knowledge that puffs up and causes others to think of themselves and not those who are weaker in the faith. And so we must be considerate of other people. Now, friends, as we think about chapters 7 and 8, Paul has asked some very difficult questions. He's asked some difficult questions by these brethren. He answers them very candidly. He shows them what God said about it from Genesis chapter 2 about marriage, how they need to live their lives, that, that there is nothing 
acceptable to God that you don't find in the Scriptures. And that same principle translates over into salvation for us today. Are you sure that you're in a right relationship with God? You know, we've been talking about the marriage relationship, but there's another relationship that's also very important, more important than marriage relationship itself, and that is your relationship with God. Friend, are you sure that you're saved? Are you sure that you've obeyed the gospel and that you're a child of God? If you can't answer that question in the affirmative, then my friend, you need to listen very carefully. And even if you think you are saved, listen so you can make sure from Scripture of what God says you need to do to be saved. Realize that it is sin that will cause a man to be lost, and we've all committed it. Romans 3.23 says the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God, Romans 6.23, is eternal life. We've all sinned, Romans 3, verse 23. And thus, because of that sin, we've been separated from God. Thank goodness, though, that Jesus came into the world to save sinners. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15. That being the case, Christ has made a way of salvation. The Scriptures clearly teach that to be saved, you first have to hear the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Romans 10 verse 17. Once I've heard the Word of God, recognized it as the final authority, I then must be willing to believe Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus said, if you don't believe that I'm He, you're going to die in your sins. John chapter 8 and verse 24. Once I recognize Jesus as the Son of God, the Savior of the world, I must be willing to repent. In Acts 3.19, Peter said, Repent and turn again, that your sins may be blotted out. Having changed my will and changed my way, then I must confess the name of Jesus. Romans 10, verse 10, the Bible says, With the heart, with the mind, one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. And yes, my friend, once I have confessed the name of Jesus, I must be baptized in water for the forgiveness of my sins. Peter said in 1 Peter 3, verse 21, Baptism does now also save us. Jesus couldn't have made it any clearer. He that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that does not believe shall be condemned. If you've never obeyed the gospel, if you're not in right relationship with God, friend, why would you wait another moment? We love you. We want you to go to heaven. We're praying that you'll obey the gospel of Christ. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned this about Christ, lost souls, not your wants. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.